And the surgeon knows how to do it, right? Okay, guys. Uh, so we're switching. Well, we're transitioning. We're evolving into evolution. And uh, today we have a guest who's a pretty, I guess you could say, you're an expert on evolution in, 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 in a sense. Um, studied, studied biology, made master's in biology, PhD in neurobiology. Uh, zoology and neurobiology. Zoology and neurobiology. Um, I do research with Jamie. Uh, very interesting <coughs> research on perception and vision in Drosophila, which are fruit flies. Um, if you were in my small group, he gave uh, sort of like a talk on what we talked about. We talked about proof in different fields, uh, proof in science versus proof in political science versus proof in math, um, which I guess everybody's been exposed to an extent. Um, and so I'll just let him, let him speak. Uh, everybody welcome, Jamie. Thank you. I'm start with a pretty boring slide, a quote. Have you guys read this while I was... Everybody read this yet? It basically says that it's pretty absurd to imagine an eye evolving. So I study vision, and I'm asked to give a talk on evolution. This is what I think of right away. Does anybody know who made this quote? I said it last year, if anyone was here. Isn't it, isn't it from uh, Candide? From what? Uh, Candide. Candide. No. Because there was a character Maybe there was something like this, but that's not this. This was from Origin of Species, Charles Darwin. If you want to see this quote, just wait for the anti-evolution group to protest outside, and they'll show you this quote. And they'll say, see, even Darwin didn't believe in evolution. What they're omitting is the rest of the quote, of course. Where Darwin goes on to say that he was really just setting up a paradox for you to think about, and that if we really think about natural selection, the way that he's explained it, that there can't really be any doubt that this is possible. Now, I'm not going to tell anybody here to believe in evolution, because I don't think I've ever converted anybody yet, but <laughs> don't tell me Darwin didn't believe in it, because all you have to do is read Origin of Species for yourself, and you know that that quote is bluntly taken out of context. Well, that's just a bunch of reading, all right? What I want to talk about is evolution. Now, evolution had a history long before it was considered in biological animals, all right? Evolution just means change over time, all right? We can, we can talk about the evolution of chemical reactions, the evolution of galaxies, the evolution of populations, the evolution of societies, all kinds of things. The evolution of writing and typography doesn't matter. Change over time. If it's changing over time, we can call it evolution. However, when we talk about population, we often mean something specific, all right, which is organic evolution or biological evolution. This is a particular type of change over time. It's the change in allele frequencies in a population over time. That's it. That's all. That covers everything that we call, what we call evolution in biology, just that. So if we know what a population is, and we know what an allele frequency is, and we know what a change is, and we know what time is, then we know what we're talking about with organic evolution. So what are those things? What's an allele? Have you guys had genetics? Does anybody know? It's written up there, too. We have these genes that code for proteins. That's part of what our cells do, is pump out proteins and, 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 uh, or pump out DNA and produce proteins from them. An allele is just one form of the gene. It makes one protein or another. It leads to things like your eye color, your limb formation, your bone density, whether your hair is curly. It boils down to these proteins and other products that the proteins can then make. Those are different alleles, and they account for the differences in animals that otherwise have the same genes. They have different allele forms of those genes. And what's a population? Well, that's just a group. It's not all the animals on the world in the world. It's not just a few individuals like in this room. It's the group of individuals that could, more or less in the wild, reproduce together in 
a short order of time. They share genetic material vertically. That means their offspring inherit their genetic material from them. All right, that's it. That's all we mean by biological evolution, organic evolution. And usually when people just say evolution and biology is on the table, that's what they mean, this specific type of evolution. So that doesn't sound so hard, just the, uh, just the mechanisms by which the allele frequencies can change. Well, let's talk about the mechanisms by which the allele frequencies can change. There aren't that many of them. We're going to start with mutation. All right, this is DNA. It gets copied. All right, it gets copied from generation to generation. And what can happen is it's copied incorrectly. Something happens to change one base to another. Remember, there are just four bases that work to code these proteins. And all we have to do is swap one for the other, and we're coding a different amino acid, and that could have a small or a large effect on the final protein. So you get some funky carrots, for instance. Most of these mutations do nothing in particular. Sometimes they don't even change the protein. Some of them do harm. Some of them do great harm. Occasionally, one, under certain circumstances, will prove beneficial. But what it does is it increases the variability in a population. All right, a, an allele that wasn't there before can spring into existence. Suddenly, we can have a new allele in a population. Maybe another mutation happened similarly another time, but it could be a completely novel mutation. Chances are very low you'd get some kind of a mutant like in X-Men, those very useful mutants. <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know how they do those. <laughs> Normally you just get funky carrots or nothing at all. Okay, so that's one way. Here's another way. Anybody know what this animal is? Lynx? Good guess. It's a little bit bigger than that. Cougar. What is a cougar? What's a mountain lion? <laughs> What's a puma? It's not a cousin of a panther. It is a panther. These are all the same species. These are Felis concolor. This is our school mascot. But what's it doing with the mountains and the snow? That's not Florida. I'm pretty sure that's not Florida. <laughs> I've never seen it. It's not even a subspecies. There's a same, well, yeah, it may, maybe it's a subspecies, but it's, um, it's an animal with an incredible all right, distribution. You can find these animals in um, Alaska, in the Arctic, and you can find them all the way down to Patagonia. All right, so two continents, and yet they're the same species. That means that if there's some mutation up in Alaska, say a tuft of hair on the ear or something like that, it could, over time, possibly centuries, because of interbreeding populations, work its way down to Patagonia, and you could see those ear tufts. You don't need selection for that. You don't need anything special. These populations are, at least historically, contiguous. They can, a, a, a mutation could work its way all that, all that way. So the population in Alaska might get genes from neighboring populations. The population in Argentina might get genes from a, neighbor po a neighboring population. That's gene flow, all right? We have populations, but they don't represent a whole species. They're just a group that likes to interbreed. And so an outsider could wander in. It could happen in your own lives. An outsider could wander in, and suddenly you have offspring that have new genetic features that weren't in your little group before, all right? Same thing could happen to mountain lions. Same thing could happen to trees, plants, fishes, flies, doesn't matter. Gene flow, that's where it comes from. We've changed the allele frequency by having it creep in from a neighboring population. All right, genetic drift. Genetic drift is a real simple one. It doesn't usually apply much to large populations like humans. It happens more strongly in small populations. And what it is is a sampling error, all right? We're sitting in this room, and we're part of a vast six-some billion people on the Earth. Some of us have brown eyes, some of us have blue eyes, some of us have green eyes, some people have even weirder color. And I'll bet that in 100 years or even 1,000 years, 
the ratio of gray eyes to blue eyes, brown eyes, whatever, is close to the same. But what if, what if the entire rest of the population accidentally was exterminated? Then our ratio right here of brown eyes to blue eyes to whatever, that's what's left. And it might not, because it's a small sample size, be representative of the population right now. So you could get a change in allele frequency because the population got small. It's a sampling error. So let me put it another way. Jelly beans. All right? If I have a big enough jar of jelly beans, it has a certain number of each color. It has a ratio. If I take a huge sample of those jelly beans, or all of them, I'll have the same ratio. I don't even have to take all of them. If I take a thousand out of that jar, and they really are well mixed, these aren't well mixed, but if they were well mixed, I'd be really surprised if I didn't get a close ratio to what was in it actually in that jar. Now let's say I can't take a thousand out of there. I can't eat that many jelly beans. I can only take a handful. All right? The chance that I'll get the ratio, say these six different colors, suddenly drops dramatically. If I can take a dozen jelly beans, I'd have to get two of each kind to maintain that ratio. Now, the metaphor breaks down here because I have to fill up a new jar with just whatever I grabbed in my handful. Jelly beans don't actually reproduce. But supposing they did, if I happen to grab four blues instead of two blues, all right, my new jar would be over-representative of blue. Does that make sense? All right, same thing with eye color, same thing with any allele we want to discuss. When the population gets low, you can have these sampling errors. Yeah, question. Doesn't genetic drift usually happen for a bottleneck effect? Yeah, a bottleneck just means that the population has gotten small. And so you have uh, suddenly this um, random changing of, of, what, of what used to be uh, different allele frequencies. Yeah. It does happen in large populations, too. It's just smaller and smaller of an effect. All right, all of these well, the other two had the effect of increasing variability. Genetic drift doesn't do that, all right? Hypothetically, if we were just confined to this room to, re, to repopulate the world, and maybe the gray-eyed people weren't so popular and the brown-eyed people were, in a generation or two, we could lose the gray eyes all together. So we've reduced variability instead of increased it. The gray eyed people would be popular. <laughs> Who knows? All right, and finally, selection. It's a common misconception to think that Darwin thought of the idea for evolution. He did not. Many biologists believe in evolution because of the fossil record and because of the similarity of certain animal groups, but they couldn't explain it. Darwin thought of a way that it could happen, a way that you could get useful traits stuck in a population. And that was selection. And this was one of the first nice examples of it that you could actually see were these moths. All right, One color gave way to another when the tree bark color changed. You can see the black moths really conspicuously. Moths don't like to be conspicuous during the day. They have to sit around, and there are birds out during the day. If you're a moth, a bird is about the scariest thing you'll ever see. All right, So the tree color determines which moths get eaten more. It's simple. Birds are just looking for food. They can eat moths. The ones they find are the ones they eat. Those are the moths that don't reproduce to give genes to the next population. Selection is not random. These others had strongly random characteristics. Selection also, people don't realize this, only decreases variability. All you're doing is taking genes out of the population. The important thing for us is Changing allele frequencies. Okay, so you need other mechanisms besides selection because selection only decreases variability. It doesn't produce any new alleles. You need other mechanisms to produce new alleles. All right, when I was an undergraduate, that was sort of the full list. <laughs> you didn't have to talk about anything else. Now there's another mechanism, and it's a tricky one. Does anybody know what this thing is? Virus? AIDS? It's a virus. It's a specific kind of virus. It doesn't have to be HIV. It's a retrovirus, exactly. 
And what that means is it's carrying RNA. HIV is an example of this. It's carrying RNA that it can push into a cell and normally DNA produces RNA. The virus also has proteins in there that make that process go backwards. So its RNA gets coded into DNA, which gets inserted into the host cell. Now, normally, this host is now, this cell is now dedicated to making more viruses. It's been co-opted for just that purpose. I don't know what a virus really wants, but I think that's what a virus wants, all right? Is to have a cell that's just making more copies of it. But the crucial thing is, it just put DNA into another organism. And this is another way that we can change allele frequencies, is that, is that a gene or an allele from a virus can get inserted into um, another individual and therefore end up in the whole population by means of horizontal transfer, all right? Not from your kids, not from the next generation. This is just right across. A virus that maybe picked up a gene from one individual, transfers it on to another. Doesn't have to be the same species. This happens in bacteria, this happens in viruses, this happens in um, uh, protozoa, small animals, and it's known now to happen in larger animals as well through mechanisms such as viruses. So you have to say there are five mechanisms, but that's it. That's how we change allele frequencies in the population. If the allele frequency is changing, we realize it must have come from one of these mechanisms. So far, that's it. All right, so what I want to talk about are eyes, all right? Because they interested Darwin, and they've interested many evolutionary biologists and anti-evolutionist protesters since then. So let's clarify this. What's this guy? Anybody know? Oh, Mikey is a good guess. A sugar what? <laughs> sugar cane? Sugar glider. Sugar glider. Sugar glider. This is a tarsier. It's an animal that has bigger eyes than does a brain. It's a primate, and it's adapted for seeing well in very dark conditions. Right now, it's kind of bright, and so its pupils are small. They get smaller still. But in the dark, that whole eye is one big black pupil, letting light in. So this animal can hunt insects even in extremely dark conditions. It's got very good eyes. But they're no, by no means the biggest eyes. But it's got very big, or it's got very good eyes. All right, before I talk much about light, I just want to make a point here. If I have a source, a point source, all right, say a little speck of light like a star, and it's close by. Well, a star can't be close by, but say just a little a little flashlight or something. If it's close to me, the rays are hitting at wildly different angles, all right? Put a flashlight close to your chest, they're hitting, they're hitting your chest here, this way, this way, all different angles. But as we move it away, the angles become closer and closer to parallel, all right? As we move farther away, the angles become more and more parallel. It's counterintuitive, but if you look at a star from far away, all the rays are coming in everywhere from the same direction. And the result is, when I walk, the star doesn't seem to move. Because everywhere I go, I'm intercepting some light from that star that's hitting my eye from the same direction. And so it's imaged at the same place on my retina. All right? That's just a little interesting point about light, but it will help you understand the things that I'm going to show you. All right. Let's start with an eye spot. All the animals I'm going to show you are extant living animals today. Not historical things, not fossils. They're animals you could find easily. What's this one? Anybody know? Good guess, but that's not it. This is a planaria, all right? In introductory biology, you often work with planaria. They're little tiny flatworms that can move around in fluids. And they have this interesting property that if you cut them up, if you want to be mean to them, if you cut them up, they can regenerate in interesting ways. They also have two things. They look a little cross-eyed sometimes. They have two little things that we call eye spots. All right? Oh, they're flatworms, right? They're flatworms. They are flatworms, yes. Yeah. All right. These eye spots, they are 
a photosensitive area. And this is not special. There are a lot of photosensitive proteins in our body, in our brain, in our blood, all right, in other areas as well. They're not necessarily eyes. This is a little conglomeration of photosensitive area. And what I'm drawing here are light rays in either um, orange or yellow. And um, visual pigment photosensitive cells in red. And imagine that there are a couple of point sources, say stars, coming from two different directions. The yellow lights are going to come in and they hit the entire surface here. Or the orange lights come in and they hit the entire surface. All they do is make it look brighter. All they do is stimulate these photosensitive cells. There's no information that the yellow light came from the right and the orange light came from the left. Once they hit this photosensitive area, all they do is stimulate it. All of our other information is lost. And because of that, I'm going to say planaria, despite we, us calling them eye spots, don't really have eyes because they don't know where those stars are. Let's contrast it with another animal. That's a cool animal. What's that? Anybody know? Centipede. Centipede's a good guess, but it's not right. Those aren't legs. Those are called kite. This is a polykeet. You could ha it has multiple kite per segment. You guys are probably familiar with oligochaetes, the ones that have very few kite per segment. Those are earthworms. So this is a segmented worm, and some, but not all of them, have a similar photosensitive area, two of them, up on their head, except instead of being flat, it makes a little cup. That's it. There's no lens. There's nothing else. Just a little indentation instead of a flat area like on the flatworm. What difference does it make? Well, look at the yellow starlight coming in. All right, This is a point in the world. It's somewhere. It's coming from some direction. Actually, it's starlight. It's not in the world. But it's still, it's a point that you can see when you're in the world, all right? And it's coming from some direction. And look at the effect of the cup. Because it's indented, the yellow light is hitting just this side of it, not the other side. Can everyone see that? The orange light is hitting just this side of it, not the other side. Can everyone see that? This animal, it has bad resolution, but it has some spatial resolution. It has some acuity, is what we say. So it has some ability to discriminate that there's an orange star over there somewhere and a yellow star over there somewhere. This is the very beginning of forming an image. This animal has an eye. It's called a cup-type eye. It's not a great eye. I wouldn't want to have this eye. I like my eyes. But it's better than the flat one. Well, let's look at another modification. What's this animal? Nautilus. A nautilus, good. A nautilus is a mollusk. In particular, it's a cephalopod mollusk, so it's related to octopuses and squids. But the nautilus doesn't have the great eye that those animals do. It has a little hole that leads to a somewhat round chamber on the inside. All right, this is a pinhole type eye. The nautilus has not so great vision. Better than the polykeep, though, because as this squeezes off, we get a sharper and sharper little point representing the yellow star, and a sharper and sharper little circle on the inside of the eye representing the orange star. Has anyone ever been to Rome and seen the Pantheon? Yeah. What does the Pantheon have? Giant dome with a small eye. Giant dome with a small hole in front. If it's raining, the rain just <laughs> hits a little circle on the inside. If the sun is out, there's a little circle on the floor. Wherever the sun is, the, the circle on the floor is on the opposite side of the sun. You don't have to go outside to see the sun if you're in the Pantheon. You just look for that spot on the floor. This is the same idea. We squeeze off this hole and we get a little circle of light because some of these cells are stimulated and others aren't, we can make an inference of where the yellow light is coming from, where the orange light is coming from, 
If the moon were bright enough, we'd see that inside the Pantheon too. Or any bright light source. You see this? The first kinds of cameras they made were camera obscura, they're called. You can sometimes see them in camera shops. Um, you can, if it's dark enough inside and bright enough outside, and you let a little tiny bit of light through, all the stuff that's down on the ground will be thrown on the back wall over there. All the stuff that's high in the sky will be thrown onto the back wall there. And you can get a reversed, left, right, reversed, up, down, reversed image of what's outside. But it has to be dark inside and it has to be bright outside. And that brings us to the problem, all right? What, is, what does this stuff want? What do these photosensitive cells want? Yeah. They want light. They want photons, right? But there's no light. Right That's now. right. There's, there's less light. and less light. In order to get sharpness, I'm squeezing this hole tighter and tighter. And so the Nautilus, the poor stupid Nautilus, has a dilemma that it wants a sharper image, but the only way to get one is to use less and less light. Cut it off from light entirely. Okay. All right, so what to do about this? That's a bad dilemma to be in. The Nautilus refuses, for reasons I can't even guess, to evolve a lens. A lens goes a long way towards solving these problems. You guys know what this is. What's that guy? Tarantula. Not a tarantula. <laughs> it's a jumping spider, salticidae. They're much smaller, they're much smaller, and they're really cool. They move so fast you can't even see them you can't even see them going in between. Tarantulas do not have good eyes. I, I've never even seen the eye on a tarantula. But the jumping spiders have fabulous eyes. And what we have in common with the, jelly, with the, um, with the tarantulas is that we have a lensed eye. The lenses bend the light. They do it based on the fact that when light hits a transparent surface because of, because of forward interference, the wave fronts move at a different angle than they were before. You can think of it as a wave front slowing down so that when it's, when it's inside the lens, it's now moving at a different angle. It slowed down when it went in, this went faster, then slowed down, this went faster, then slowed down. You can see this on the beach. All right, Far away, it's deep. As the water comes in, as the waves come in, they get into more shallow water and they slow down. And it drags them to being very um, parallel to the, to the um, shoreline. All right? Waves almost always come in more or less directly, unless you're standing at a deep part, like a pier that just drops off rather than rises gradually. Then they can come from any angle because they don't slow down in advance. All right? That's sort of behind the bending of this light. If you hit head on, you don't really bend, but if you hit at an angle, you bend inwards. And if you design the lens just right, you can make a sharp little point without having to shrink down your pupil. That's what the Nautilus was stuck doing. That's what the chimp and the jumping spider don't have to do. They can let in a lot of light and still get a nice sharp point down here. Does that make sense? Good job, chimp. The big spider. All right, it's a nifty trick, but it requires light to be moving near the speed of light, near the actual speed of light in the air, and then more slowly once it hits the cornea. The octopus and other fishes, or, and fishes, this fish and, and sharks and other kinds of fish, they're already in the water. And the index of refraction, the density of seawater, is really close to that of their cornea. And so when it hits their cornea, it doesn't bend that much. Well, that's a problem. They're not going to make a sharp image that way. So they have a different sort of structure inside. This lens, it's called a Matthiessen lens, doesn't have a constant index of refraction. All right? Our cornea and then our lens have pretty much constant indices of refraction. They slow down the light by a certain amount. They're a certain density all the way through. This is a whole sphere. So the light spends a lot of time going through it. 
and the density increases as we go towards the middle. What that lets it do is bend the light continuously as it goes through, rather than just at the surfaces. And it lets the fish form a nice sharp image, even though they're underwater. Now there are a few animals that have to go back and forth. If the fish comes out of water, it's bending the light um, way too much. If you go underwater, you're not bending the light enough. But what does a seal do? Seals go back and forth. They tend to have lenses that look like this, but then very flat corneas. So whether they go in or out of the water, they have it covered both times. Some of them possibly can change the pressure in their eye to actually change the shape of the eye to accommodate for being above and below the water. It's pretty neat. But it brings up the fundamental problem of seeing underwater. If you guys go underwater, what's, what's it look like? Blurry. Unless you put on a mask. And all that does is create a little layer of air so that your eyes can then bend the light correctly. The fish could solve the problem if it came up, if it put little goggles on that had water inside of the goggles. <laughs> <laughs> it would. It's just like, what the All right. This should be the best eye in the world. It, 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 lo it looks like a mirror. It should. It's not. I'm only aware of one animal that has this eye. What is it? It's a clam. Yeah. It's a kind of clam. Specific oh. one. Not all clams have eyes. It's not a, not a giant clam. Good guess. This is called a scallop. There we go. All right? And scallops have this, have this um, reaction that if there's a shadow of a predator or something else that disturbs them, they can actually start going back and forth and back and forth, and they can move and so get away from stuff. It's pretty clever, right? But doesn't it, it just does it aimlessly, right? Because it just opens and closes. I'm not sure. It looks aimless. <laughs> it may be totally aimless, but I bet if you really worked it, um, that they might have some bias away from their predator. Yeah, question. I, I can't imagine that a scallop can move like super duper fast, so... Oh, it it's... The, what I was doing with my hand, this is what it does. Wouldn't that potentially attract away. the predator more than like standing still? It depends on the predator. A scallop can close, and it can stay, like other clams, it can stay really close. Like unless you have a knife to slide in there, it's hard to get it open, all right? A fish can't get it open. The predators that these guys are mostly worried about are things like sea stars. Otters can smash them. I don't know what they do about the otters. otters can smash them. But sea stars have a way of just prying them open over the course of hours. Sea stars are slow. So they're getting away from the sea stars pretty effectively. It's true. They might draw attention to themselves. And maybe that's all balanced in whether they decide to uh, move. The thing is, mirrors have some huge advantages over lenses. All right? One thing I didn't mention about lenses is that the whole bending of light is frequency dependent, meaning blue light is bent more than red light. So if you have a picture that has blue light and red light in it, there's no one place that the focal length lands. All right, this is called chromatic aberration, and it's an issue. It's an issue for um, lens telescopes, it's an issue for our eye, it's an issue for all kinds of animals, is that there are multiple focal planes depending on the wavelength of the light. Mirrors do not have that problem. They reflect the light at the same angle. All that matters is the angle of incidence. So mirrors have a huge advantage over lenses in that. And that's why the finest optical um, equipment that's ever been made are mirrored imaging systems. What's this animal? Hubble. That's Hubble. That's right. A space telescope. You couldn't possibly bring those lenses up into space, or it'd cost a fortune if you did. But a mirror is a much lighter optical element to bring up. These clams have a problem, though. All right, These scallops have a problem. And part of it is that their photoreceptors are actually in the path of light as it goes inwards and then focuses there. So basically, the light goes through the photoreceptors at least twice. That's, that's once too many. Only focused light should hit the photoreceptors. Anything else reduces the contrast. So it's a bad deal for them. They don't end up having sharp vision. This is a technology that doesn't scale downwards well. Well, in the case of the of the of the scalp, isn't wouldn't that that 
the fact that the light goes through it twice mm -hmm. not be necessarily an issue because they're very limited in their field of motion, I guess, you would call it? Maybe so. Um, the only thing is, they don't end up having good vision from it. Yeah. Maybe they don't need good vision. Remember I said, all the animals I'm showing you are extant living animals. I'm not looking at anything from hundreds of millions of years ago, right? And so, presumably some of these animals don't have better vision like the, uh, like the Nautilus because it's not an important selective factor in their evolutionary history. All right, what else have we got? All right, the lenses and such that I've been showing you, the eyes that I've been showing you are really good eyes, all right? Some of them, I didn't show you, say, an eagle or a falcon, but they have resolution that exceeds your own, all right? In other words, they could see details that are invisible to you. These eyes are much more popular, but they're not as good. The very first thing that I showed you was a little, um, was a flat eye and then one that bent inwards, a concave eye, right? Just as easily, I could bend that eye outwards and it would have about the same resolution. In other words, light coming in here would be in the shit, it would be, would hit here and the photoreceptors here would be in the shadow. It's almost as good as bending it inwards as bending it outwards. But later on, when lenses show up, all right, when screening pigment shows up, having chosen to bend outwards to make a convex eye, a convex retina, turns out to be a bad deal. Because the only way then to put lenses on is to put individual elements through every pixel you want to see, again and again. And because these are small, that means that they're diffraction limited. A lot of organs in the body, like say the spleen or the heart or such, we don't talk about how big they are. The kidney, the kidney is a good one. You look at these, um, you look at these pieces of the kidney in a little desert rat, and they're and they're relatively big. They're not necessarily the longest uh, nephrons, but they're relatively big. And so we care about how what's the relative size of the heart. We care about what's the relative size. Of the, of the fur or whatever else. With eyes, we deal with absolute sizes, all right? Bigger eyes are better. They see more crisply. Bigger telescopes are better. You can do some clever things to make smaller ones reasonably good, sometimes even great, but if you scale it up, you get better resolution and better sensitivity, and that's a lot of what eyes are after, okay? These are small lenses, and they're stuck that way. All right, because the, ends, the animals that possess them, some of them are flyers, and they can't carry arbitrarily big lenses. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, one question, the dragonflies, right? Yes. Wait, well, dragonflies are the single biggest predator in the world right now. I mean, we have a 90-year chance to escape nature. I'm a great admirer of dragonflies. I, yes. There's a million fish, so I, I sincerely doubt that. That I, um, the way their eyes are structured are not working out, especially since the group eyes won't be I'm, I'm not going to say it's not working out. What I'm going to say is it doesn't create a sharp picture as, say, a thousand years ago. All right, consider this more successful than dragonflies are bacteria. They don't see at all. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm not using this as a proxy for how good the animal is or how good it is at any particular task. I'm using it just as a proxy for how sharp their vision is. And their vision, despite them being massively successful, not so much the dragonflies, but say flies, beetles, bees, these are, these are um, as a group, there are potentially five million species of insects all right, there are 100,000 species of flies. Do you know how many mammals there are total? Like about 4,000. No, what? Lord. What? That's how many species of mammals there Extent, are. Extinct, right? Extinct, yes. That's but even if you do the extinct ones, it wouldn't add up to that much. Like 50. I don't know. <laughs> but when you're talking about 100,000 species of flies, and those are the extant ones as well, um, it just pales in comparison. All right, these are massively successful animals, but they don't have great eyes. 
Anybody know what this one is? Mantis shrimp. Hey, okay. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> the badass of the ocean. Mantis shrimp is just the greatest. Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Your dog is a dichromat, meaning it has two different kinds of color detectors. You're a trichromat, unless you're one of the one or two of the males in here are probably dichromats. But you see things it's similar to your dog, perhaps. <laughs> but um, the females are probably all trichromats here. They have three different kinds of color receptors that they can pair to judge the wavelengths of light in this room. There are goldfish that have maybe five different receptors. A lot of bees have four. I can name lots of animals that have two, three, four, and five different color receptors. I can only name one that has 13. It's out of this world. This is a tetrachromat just in the ultraviolet. And not only that, it can see polarized light. Lots of animals. If you want to see polarized light yourself, get a nice pair of sunglasses and look up at the sky, not at the sun, but down from the sun, and tilt your head back and forth, and it will change intensity. A lot of animals see that as another sort of color. All right? But this is the only animal known that not only can see that linear polarized light, it can also see circularly polarized light. That's, That's something vision biologists didn't even think they'd have to understand until a few years ago when the stupid mana shrimp made us have to go <laughs> study it and figure out how it works. Okay. Not only that, they can move each of their eyes independently, much like, say, geckos can. But these guys can also rotate their eyes. That's a that's a really good question. They see circularized polarized circularly polarized light, and as far as anyone knows, they're the only ones that make any circularized polarized light. So they're looking at each other. They've been documented to have bluff behavior, and they have a really neat thing. If you ever see one of those, I recommend you don't just try to grab it because they're also called thumb splitters. <laughs> they can punch hard enough to break your skin. Occasionally, they've broken aquarium glasses and had the aquarium drain, and, well, they die back. Don't they, <laughs> 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 Don't they break the barrier of sound? Yeah, when they, when they do punch, they, um, they, they, their, their punch goes faster than the speed of sound in water, and so it creates behind the water what's called a cavitation, a vacuum, that then closes up very quickly, makes a snapping sound, and leaves scars on the back of their uh, punching appendages. <laughs> it's pretty wild. They're out of this world. Mid strippers talk about snap. All right. I told you that light just has to pass through one of these little apertures. In fact, yeah, somebody said dung beetle. It's got its ball of dung, which is a prize for these guys. Anybody know what that is? Animal I used to work on. That's a hawk moth. That's right. And you can see it's got a big red pupil. All right. Normally, when you look at an insect eye, only a couple of the facets look a different color than the rest of them. Those are the facets that the insect is seeing you with. And wherever you go, there are a couple dark facets that the insect is looking at you with. All right. This one has a whole suite of them. It involves setting up these complex, these are just like in the fish, these are eyes that, these are lenses that have a, that have a graded index of refraction. And so they actually focus the light twice. And it achieves this dog earring of the light so that even though it enters through multiple facets, it can all end up at one photoreceptor if it came from one direction. By multiple facets, I mean hundreds or thousands. Now your pupil between the, the, the daylight and the darkness goes from maybe three millimeters to nine millimeters. All right, that's you know a factor of 10 or so in terms of the increase in area. It's fine, it's respectable. But these guys can get maybe 3,000 times as much light into their eye by opening up their pupil. It comes at a cost. Their eye has to remain roughly spherical, which for an insect means that their resolution doesn't change as they look into their peripheral vision. That's more important than you think, all right? You have crappy peripheral vision, right? It's not very sharp. You can't read with your peripheral vision. Not just because you can't concentrate on the air, it's actually not high enough resolution. 
but it is faster than your forward vision. It's lower resolution, but it's faster. That's one of the trade-offs in vision, is if you um, give up resolution, you can get other qualities, like sensitivity or speed. All right, here's another neat one. These guys have, this is a, a decapod under the water, so it's not good at using lenses. It wants to have one of these, um, one of these eyes as well, one of these eyes that lets in more light as well, but it's underwater, so this double refraction, or this double um, dog earring refraction is hard to do. What it does instead, this is, so this is a, um, say a shrimp or something, what it does instead is has boxes. All right, these are mirrored boxes. Question. Are these uh, crabs and... Uh, crabs, yeah. And, uh, it's not all crabs, but some of them have this superposition eye. Here they can let light in through hundreds of facets, but they do the dog earring by mirrors instead of by, uh, instead of by lenses. And the, neat, the interesting thing about them, you can tell that they have this because their eyes are set up in rows and columns rather than hexagons. It's a less efficient packing, but it lets them do this mirror trick. Okay, and finally, flies and mosquitoes have their own unique kind of eye where they have six and actually a seventh uh, photoreceptor in each eye. And the light coming from a common direction actually goes through a few different photoreceptors, a total of say six or seven, and hits, or sorry, goes through a few different facets and hits a different photoreceptor in each one. The problem with this is that the image is backwards and so the nervous system remaps it correctly once it gets down to the bottom. It's a remarkable trick. Only flies and mosquitoes do it, it gives them some nighttime sensitivity, but not great nighttime sensitivity, all right? Bees very, very rarely fly in the middle of the night. Maybe on full moons, sometimes you'll see it, but not very often, all right? Moths have no trouble flying in the middle of the night. Flies and mosquitoes, a lot of them prefer dusk and dawn. It's not too hot, but it's dark enough that you don't exactly notice that they've landed on you to swat them. Right? So that's, that's their preference. And this is part of the reason that they can do it, because they have this particular eye design. All right, now I want to talk about the evolution of these eyes. Like I said, every one of the eyes that I mentioned today is alive and functioning today. They all work by themselves. The paper came out in the 90s sometime by a friend of mine that showed that if we morph an eye, starting with the flatworm, which isn't really an eye, and just bend it in, change the index of refraction, we can end up with a perfectly functional fisheye. This is all done on a computer, all hypothetical, but one of the questions that these anti-evolutionists ask is what good is half an eye? As if the intermediate form of our eye would be one of them cut in half. The point of this paper was to show that every intermediate stage in this hypothetical progression is sharper and sharper vision. Every intermediate stage is not, only, is not only present, we can show that they can morph smoothly from one to the other and increase the sharpness at each stage. Now, it's not fair to say that sharpness of vision is a proxy for fitness because, as someone pointed out already, a lot of animals are perfectly fit without sharp vision. But vision has certainly been helpful to many animals and so to the degree that it affects fitness, we can have an increasing contribution to an animal's ability to survive, find mates, find food, whatever else it feels like doing. All right, this was just a set up set of changes. I got curious about this too and made a little mathematical model of a random um, retina the direction of the light coming in and the um, amount of light hitting each um, spot is mapped here. Retinal position, direction of light. Ideally, what we want is a straight line so that every direction of light corresponds to a unique position, position on the retina. This is something like 
a flat non-eye, like a flatworm's eye, and you can see that we have a cloud of points. That's no good. All right. All I did was simulate evolution on the computer and chose the best sighted animals for reproduction and random mutation. And after, I think it was 20 generations, you can get a pinhole type eye with a comparatively sharp distribution. In other words, retinal position where the light is hitting tells you a lot about what angle it was coming in at. That's 20 generations. All right. If you want to be an anti-evolutionist, there are issues that you could bring up that are hard to answer. Not impossible, but hard, like sex. All right. Why would a female that could presumably make a clone of herself bother to have sex and produce a child that's half related to her? That's a hard question, even for evolutionary biologists to answer. The eye is not. The eye is an easy one. That's a slow pitch to an evolutionary biologist, okay? Because you can make them evolve right on your computer and see that there is no harm, no difficulty in understanding intermediate stages. Ask them about the sex question. That's a harder one. <laughs> I'm not saying that's unanswerable. I'm just saying it's a head scratcher, right? All right, that's all I've got. So if you have questions, let me know. And the mosquito develops very particular. Excuse me, maybe if it, uh, it's hard to hear the question, oh. so you can either stand up or project. <laughs> you don't want to project them. How come the fly and the mosquito develop this uh, hexagonal shape, is it? On oh. their eyes. So are you thinking of the, it's called a neural superposition eye? The, yeah, the that, special that, eye that just they had. The yeah. shapes that it presents in the, yeah. uh, the eyes. So externally, it looks a lot like any other insect eye. It's just this neural architecture underneath. And it's only been known, as far as I know, for, I mean, decades, not, not centuries, right? And so, um, and so I don't know if they know exactly what drove the evolution of that, except maybe crepuscular behavior. In other words, a group of animals that was successful near dawn and near dusk um, started to drive that evolution. That's just a guess. I don't know if that's... That's right. Yeah. Question. Uh, did this thing called speciation and you correct me if I'm wrong? Uh -huh. But what's when like uh, I guess two species become uh, completely like separable because they can't reproduce, right? Yeah. But you did mention the how like uh, genes can transfer uh, vertically, right? Mm -hmm. so That's the normal way, yeah. Huh? That's the usual way okay, that we yeah, thought of it. Yeah. Uh, so I like, it's possible you have like let's say two species that like can reproduce but they have like common, you know, like cousins. Mm -hmm. For like genes to like transfer, you know, to that you know line of cousins to the other one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it it's totally messy. All right, I present it as somewhat the the clean idealized version. All right, and the general definition of species, the one I like the best in the textbooks, is um, they reproduce together in the wild. All right, if you bring a tiger and a lion into a zoo and sedate them and get them used to each other, they can make a liger or a tion, depending on who the mother was, right? Um, but in the wild, they generally won't do that. They'll tear each other apart. Okay, so the general definition, do they reproduce together in the wild? It doesn't cover the very common cases where you've got A reproducing with B, B reproducing with C, but A can't be reproduce with, with C, all right? Stuff like that happens all the time. It's even worse with plants, because in plants you get um, this doubling of the genome from time to time and, and other things. Occasionally you get animals that can't reproduce anymore, all right? Um, the whiptail lizards um, only reproduce through female parthenogenesis, meaning the mothers, in this case, this thing that I said would be such a great idea for females just to clone themselves, get the males out of the picture, that's all that's left with whiptail lizards. There are no more males. So every female just makes a clone of herself. In the fossil record, these groups are usually very short-lived. And that's another question. Why is that? Why does parthenogenesis actually end up being such a bad strategy? But there are some animals right now that do it, whiptail lizards. You can consider, even though they're a group that all look kind of alike, that every single female is their own species because there's no reproduction in the wild. The complications are endless in this case of what well, properly forms a species.
Aren't there boas that also do that? Talk about that? Snakes. There, there are lots of animals that do it, but usually they don't do it exclusively, right? A lot of insects, for instance, can reproduce without a mate, but they will, depending on the circumstances, either use a mate or not. A lot of times when there are lots of males or when the environment is good, they'll, they'll reproduce sexually, and when the uh, resource is low or something like that, they'll reproduce asexually. That's one of the things you see, but not always that way. Not always that way. That's my best guess of it. You can make mathematical models that, where you have what you call a facultative sexual reproducer, one that can reproduce um, sexually or asexually. And, you, and, if, and if you keep the environment constant, it's almost always better off doing it asexually. But if you make the environment variable, all right, it changes a lot from generation to generation, then any animal reproducing asexually will likely go extinct. Um, kind of kind of abruptly when the environment's not in its favor. Whereas if you spread your genes out and mix them, the genes are more likely to be present in a highly variable environment many, many generations forward if you reproduce sexually. That's my best understanding of it, but I don't know that it's proven as the reason. There are completely different theories than that about why about what sexual reproduction is for. Wildly different ones. But I'm not gonna say which one's right. Yeah. Sorry, can we go back to the computer model that you did mm -hmm. of the eye. Um, yeah. How many of the mechanisms that you talked about at the beginning of the lecture did you incorporate into that model? Well, so let's see. I did the mutation. There's no gene flow because there is no other population. Um, there's there's um, some genetic drift, but it's constant because I always use the same number of individuals. So there's 100 individuals. So there could certainly be genetic drift, but it's constant. And then there is selection because what I did was called a roulette style of, um, of, um, of reproduction. Your chance of reproduction depends on how good your eye is in this case. So it's just a proxy for fitness. And what you do is you imagine a roulette wheel with a whole population in there. And how good your sight is, that determines how wide your bin is. So in Las Vegas, the roulette wheel, every bin is the same size. Imagine if I had one that was really big because that individual could see really well, and some that were really, really small because those individuals can't see well at all. Um, that's, that's how I did it in that particular model. A lot of similar schemes will yield identical results, though. But yeah, so they have a chance of reproduction that's based on how, how, um, how well they see. Uh huh. So those like like a more secure society mean like slower evolution? Yeah, I I wouldn't say that for sure. I don't know. Um, there there are people who study rate of evolution, and uh, and I think some people think that some of that's not some of their conclusions aren't totally valid. That the rate of evolution could be an object of selection itself. I don't know. I don't know if that's right or not. I've heard people say it. I've heard other people discount it. But a lot of what determines the rate of evolution is how fast the generation time is. And there are some big advantages to having a fast generation time. I mean, think about cockroaches and bacteria and mushrooms and things like that. They come and go. Yeah, there's less and less chance. Um, but big animals do evolve, all right? There are whales, even we're relatively big animals. Elephants, they have a two-year pregnancy, almost. All right, 22 months, I think it is. All right, they're slow reproducing. And in some environments, they thrive. But in an environment where there's a high death rate, elephants don't do well. In fact, no big, slow reproducing animal does. That's one of the reasons a lot of times you can listen to some, uh, some individuals who think that there's no real concern if a lot of animals are going extinct or if the climate is changing. The biggest concern to me, even if I didn't care about all the animals and plants in the world, is that when there's a climatic change, it's the biggest animals that tend to go the most extinct, if that makes sense. And we're on the big side of animals, all right? We're, by all hallmarks, um, the kind of animal that's most likely to suffer during an environmental change. That's what scares me about it, personally. Entirely selfish. <laughs> yeah, question. Um, I, th I, think, I think you could argue that in contemporary times we're increasing generation time, but not because our reproductive clock is changing, 
you can read like Romeo and Juliet, and they're getting married. What when she's 13, 13 years old? Yeah, and now. Yeah, so and there's a whole theory of aging that goes that if you if you have a secure long life, like say a bird is getting away, is good at getting away from predators, then you're better off uh, doing things like um, delaying reproduction and putting more time and energy into growth, um, and um, and uh, um, yeah, growing bigger and getting uh, more secure. It's only the case if you have a strong chance of living longer. If, you're, if your mortality rate is high, then you're better off getting your reproduction out of the way because you might not get to at all under those circumstances. Now, whether humans are actually evolving to take longer to reproduce or not, I, I don't know for sure. Everything I know about it could be explained by diet and other environmental circumstances. But, th but there might be a change in allele frequencies that's causing this. But it could be just that we're eating better, and so, um, you know, girls, for instance, uh, grow, grow differently, and so, um, become, and, and boys too become reproductively active later, later on. They also then, now with birth control, like, you, you can't say what's going on for sure. But a lot of people put off reproduction until they suddenly find they're not able to do it anymore. So the, cl the clock is still ticking, in particular for women who, in their um, 30s and 40s, their chance of being able to reproduce drops dramatically. And this is why there's a huge business now in, um, in uh, increasing uh, fertility of older individuals. If you want to be really rich, figure out some way to do that because a lot of people are frustrated to find out that they were waiting to have kids that suddenly they can't. Other questions? Okay. There's no more questions. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.